An MP has said she is considering her future in the Labour Party after obsessive harassment from current and former party members. Let's take you through a timeline of events. So last year, Rosie Duffield, the MP for Canterbury, was forced to deny being transphobic after liking a tweet saying women were people with cervixes. She said she was completely supportive of trans rights. Duffield said she felt unable to attend last year's Labour conference because of the controversy. She has now been accused of moving 200 miles away from her constituency in a blog post allegedly written by members of her own party. She described the allegation as personal, libelous, nasty and fictional crap. She said she has not moved to Wrexham, where her partner is based. She said she was seriously considering whether to quit Labour because she did not feel supported by the party. Author and journalist Joanna Williams has come out in defence of Duffield in her spiked online column this week, and she joins me now. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about what happened here. Can you just give some background here to Rosie Duffield? Why has she stirred so much ire? Because we see her on TV and she seems such a mild-mannered, nice individual, right? I'm sure she absolutely is. I mean, she's my MP. I live in Canterbury, so she represents me. And I think what's really interesting about what's happened to Rosie is, for one thing, the speed with which it's happened. So uh, she quite famously won the seat of Canterbury, being the first person to turn this um, seat that had been blue, it had been Conservative voting mm. for over 100 years and she won it in uh, for the Labour Party in 2017 and she was so loved for having yeah. done that I mean she was really praised and worshipped and she did it again in 2019 I have to say at that point I was very skeptical about her her whole um, electoral slogan was Rosie for Remain vote Rosie vote Remain and presumably you're not for and Remain I was not for Remain <laughs> she didn't get my vote at that point I was very very skeptical about her and then like you say it was in 2020 when something started to happen and there was actually something prior to what you've said she actually liked a tweet by Piers Morgan and it was Piers Morgan who'd made the comment oh, um, kiss about of death <laughs> Exactly, right. exactly. But again, you know, what's interesting in that is this obsessive scrutiny which she's being subjected yeah. to. You know, for people to actually be monitoring not just what she tweets, which would be understandable, but actually tracking which tweets she's liking and holding her up and, and making big public statements yes. on the basic basis of her having liked a tweet. I mean, that's something that's happening a lot more now, isn't it? People checking which things you like, who follows you and yeah. who you follow, and this obsessive kind of thing it about is. moral purity, but why is it this particular issue? Why is it this issue about trans issues? I mean, and her comment about women having cervixes. I mean, I did biology GCSE, so I, I, think, <laughs> I think she's right. I think she's right. Well, I think there are a couple of things going on here. And, you know, I, I really do take my hat off to Rosie because it would have been very easy after that first storm for her to have backed down. I mean, she didn't even need to apologise or deny, but she could have just kept quiet at that point. Yeah. And I think a lot of people in her position would have seen this backlash coming and decided, you know what, I'm just not going to go there. Yeah. I just, just, my job's not worth it. You know, I can't, can't take that hassle uh, but she didn't and she has carried on and I can only assume it does come from this very principled um, place. So she's spoken out a number of times about her own experiences of domestic violence and actually the importance of having a single sex space. Yeah. If you've been subject to something like that, you want to go into a place where there are only other women. I mean, maybe even just for a short space of time, sure. but you want that security. And she was aware that by allowing gender self-identification for any man to come along and just say, oh, I'm a woman, immediately takes away that capacity for you to have a single sex space. It's very interesting because so many of the, the feminists and women generally who have made these points have, are often coming from a place of experience of domestic violence and then all of a sudden they're painted as the evil ones in this debate. The people, you know, they're just making that point, like you say, someone who's been through that kind of trauma. I mean, you know, it makes sense to me that they would want to be just in a, a female-only space. But of course, if you buy into the idea that, that uh, gender self-ID is all that is required to actually become the other sex, then that, the idea of single-sex spaces doesn't make sense, I suppose. Absolutely. But I think this is also why Rosie and, and people like her, J.K. Rowling, would be another example of a very mild-mannered, very left-wing, very progressive mm. uh, woman who comes in for all this flack. And I think it's because they're speaking from that experience. And I think it's also their refusal to back down and their refusal to compromise. I think so many of these um, progressive or woke kind of activists assume that if they just shout loudly enough, people will back 
back down, people will apologise. Yeah. And in both J.K. Rowling um, and Rosie Duffield, they've met a woman who is ostensibly on their side, somebody who's very much on the left, like I say, the Rosie for Remain, mm. she was one of them, and yet she hasn't apologised for what she said. She has refused to back down. And I think they can't cope with that. No, I mean, isn't that the case? Because most people do back down. Or, like you say, they don't get involved to begin with. Exactly. I mean, I, I've spoken to women uh, in politics, and I'm thinking of someone in particular, actually, she's very famous, who said to me, I just want... I have... She has similar views to Rosie Duffield, but she says, I'm just not going to say anything. Because she sees what happens to J.K. Rowling, to Rosie Duffield, two women who put their necks out, and particularly women more than men, I have to say. I think that's true. And I think often what it is that you're on the receiving end of, obviously it's the death threats that get all the headlines, sure. but I think it's the real obsessive scrutiny that really grinds you down. And now I'm in no way comparing my experience at the university to J.K. Rowling's, but I think it's it, uh, or to Rosie Duffield's. But certainly what happened to me was just that, that feeling of being held to a higher standard yes. than everybody else. It's like if your views fit in with the kind of progressive majority, then that's absolutely fine. And it's almost like you get a pass then on what you're doing. But if you're going to argue something a little bit different, suddenly you find that the scrutiny that you're subjected to or the standards that you're expected to meet are just so much higher. I mean, mm. impossibly higher and yes. nobody can live under that scrutiny you know where is Rosie today um, what did she have for her lunch who's she meeting yeah you yeah. know how much time has she spent in her constituency yeah. what tweets is she like exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly you can't live your life like that so can I'm not surprised she's considering her position well can I ask you about the, uh, the, the, the Labour Party's response um, because it, it strikes me that in a lot of these cases figures of authority are failing to protect their own I mean if I take the example of Anne Henderson uh, in, in Scotland I think she was at Edinburgh University. She was the rector there for, for three years and she was accused of similar things. Uh, she had a campaign of harassment that went on for over a year and she went to the authorities at the university and said, look, can you support me in this? And they said that it, it wouldn't be worth it. You know, we, yeah. we should just... You know, but these are people sending threats of, of abuse. I mean, at some point, doesn't the Labour Party, in the case of Rose, Rosie Duffield, have to say, look, we might disagree yeah. on the issues, but abuse and threats and death threats and you not being able to come to the party conference, that's not OK, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And again, you've seen it, I mean, most famous example perhaps is Kathleen Stock's yeah. treatment at the University of Sussex. I mean, I think there's institutional cowardice here. Right. You know, I don't actually believe that everybody at, at the top of these institutions really hates Rosie Duffield, Kathleen Stock. I don't believe they completely disagree with them even to that, that much of an extent. But there's just cowardice. There's mm. an awareness that if they speak out, they even speaking out in defence of these individuals, they risk attracting all this flack upon the institution. Yes. And, and that cowardice, I think that intellectual and moral cowardice is what erodes um, so much trust and faith and it erodes everybody else's um, opportunity to speak out or potential to dare stick their heads above the parapet. So is the solution for these bodies and figures and institutions to just take a, a, a stand against the more aggressive activists? Oh, well, I think somebody like Rosie Duffield and J.K. Rowling then become these fantastic role models for children, mm. you know, and it's such a shame, I think, that J.K. Rowling House, for example, has been dropped from so many schools because actually these women are showing that you can hold on to your principles, you can continue to speak out, and yeah, you know, the people might not like you, people might object, but you can keep your head together, you can do it, you can stand up to the bullies, and, and we need more people like them in the world.